Welcome back to the Smart Contract Summit. Uh, next up, we have a panel I'm personally really excited about. You can best think about it as a sort of crossover DeFi and gaming panel. The title is Gaming, Art, and Collectibles for Business or Pleasure. Uh, we're joined today by Jesse Johnson of Bullion X Navegachi, Dan Gunsberg of HXRO, John John Clark of Wildcards, and <coughs> Vlad, uh, Vlad Kashminikov of War Riders, who will be joining shortly. I believe he's having some. Uh, audio issues right now. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, I wanted to kick off today by talking about a macro trend that personally really excites me. Uh, this is the gamification of financial platforms or markets and vice versa, the financialization of games on the blockchain. Um, all of your projects are involved with this trend to some degree. And so I want you guys to start off by introducing yourselves but also explaining where you fit into this ongoing process. Uh, John, John, uh, let's start with you. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, firstly, it's yeah, it's great to be here. I'm John, John, I'm one of the co-founders of a project called Wildcards. And very quickly to give you a little heads up, if you don't know what Wildcards is, wildcards.world is a, a project started by myself and my friends and ideas to raise funds for endangered animals and really push the boundaries in, in how we actually do that. And we use a lot of interesting um, economic mechanisms, something called harbage attacks, and we use NFTs, and essentially users can become the guardians of these NFTs. And through becoming the guardians of these NFTs, they consistently channel funds into organizations that we support around the world that are actually on the ground doing work. And obviously this allows a lot of um, transparency and users can very easily support these different organizations in a gamified way. So yeah, I'm looking forward to telling you more about all of us throughout the course. Well, let's just head around uh, clockwise. Jesse, you're next up. Oh, okay. Yeah, so my name is Jesse. Um, I've been working with NFTs for quite a few couple of years now, and um, what I've been working on is value staked NFTs as of late. So the idea being that NFTs have a lot of speculative nature, and there's a value to that uh, indisputably. But then there's also this idea that you can use the NFTs and wrap ERC20 tokens or different things inside. So that journey started with uh, the, uh, something called BullionX, where we took uh, gold stable coins from Digix and the DGX gold coins, where one gram equaled one DGX. And we actually would stake specific amounts through a smart contract to an NFT that was 3D, beautiful, and interactive. And you're able to go and collect these, but also have a kind of base foundation value in the gold. And so that's really exciting. And we collaborate with a lot of different crypto artists to do that. And um, the community has really enjoyed it. It's been live since March and really well, well received. So since then, we've kind of taken that and built on what we could do more with it. And DeFi tokens have so much potential because they're interest bearing. So what we're building is Avagachi, which is DeFi staked crypto collectibles where you're actually able to take those A tokens like A link or all the US, AUSDC, these kind of things, and take that interest earned and gamify it. So we have cute pixelated ghosts that are actually the, uh, the return of liquidated yield farmers, and they're determined to come back in this pixelated form and use their DeFi tokens and their interest bearing traits to play games, mini games, and interact throughout a uh, an Avagachi DAO. So I'm the summoner of the Avagachi DAO, one of the four summoners, and it's it's got a lot of potential. We're launching in a couple of weeks, and this totally is embracing this idea that the entire Web3 experience is really one big MMO RPG. And so we're trying to make that explicit with uh, Avagachi. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Vlad. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Vlad. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cardify, which is the company behind War Riders. War Riders is an MMO game based on uh, earning cryptocurrency, uh, customizing vehicles, and battling opponents. Um, player, players use their own war vehicles and weapons, which are the non-fungible tokens on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, to mine and um, or farm the in-game currency, Benzene uh, or BZ. 
BZN is an ERC20 token, which is used for internal and external purchases, uh, such as purchasing different things in the game uh, or um, like exchanging it on Uniswap, for example. Uh, we, we recently started actively co collaborating with Chainlink and launched a few uh, cool things together, such as uh, human-readable usernames for smart contracts and so forth. Thanks, Vlad. Uh, Dan, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Dan Gunsberg. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hero, spelled uh, H-X-R-O. Um, so we launched Hero uh, basically to create a, uh, a, a one-stop crypto uh, exchange platform that really allowed traders of all skill levels to interact with the market financially using crypto, but really with weaving in distinct uh, gamification and metagame loops into it. And uh, the idea being that my background, my partner's background, um, we came up through the um, the trading world in Chicago. It started in the on the floor of the uh, Chicago Board of Trade and worked our ways up, you know, as electronic trading became more prevalent um, onto these big trading floors. And a lot of the day over day excitement, the competitiveness, a lot of the fun of being on an exchange actually or a proprietary trading floor came with all these kind of emotional rewards. And we found when we were trading in crypto that it was very nascent, very raw and like in pretty much even in legacy um, markets as well. It's just all about the financial for the most part. But really, there is this emotional element that really drives the majority of users to it. And um, while we were talking through that, we came up. It's funny, Jesse said that um, you know what, what they're doing being kind of the uh, the global MMORPG, and it's funny that we call trading like global trading the ultimate MMORPG because everything about the way that uh, you interact globally with others, the strategies that are run, the competition. There's a there's a definitely like a hierarchy between like having like whales or kind of like they call them in Wall Street, like big swinging dicks or something like that. Um, <laughs> and uh, the team, there's there's a lot of teamwork like between, um, you know, different uh, participants that are all working with, you know, for the same entity or for the same desk. It all element, it, it all distills the elements of trading down to one big, very, very competitive game. And so our idea was to take, um, you know, was to take, uh, uh, you know, financial markets weave in these kind of game concepts, game loops to it, um, and and also take what are otherwise can be very esoteric type of products that um, you know a lot of financial derivative products can be hyper complex. They're only like really understood by a small number of people. Taking those and then delivering a user experience that was super simplified, like really stripping them down, making them simple, making them useful, making them fair, transparent. Um, and uh, and ultimately a, must, a much more robust and engaging experience and user journey um, as the trader becomes more actively ingrained participant uh, in the platform. Great, thanks guys. Um, I think this is an all-star panel, just a lot of really fascinating projects here. Uh, really excited to get into it. Um, I wanna start with John, John and Jesse. I think um, you guys both have these platforms that are gamified to a certain degree, but Avigachi and Wildcards are pushing forward the idea of gamified governance. And so I wanna know what work you're doing in this area and what you think the future of game gamified governance looks like. John, if you wanna cool. go first. Cool, I'll go for it. Um, yeah, so thanks, Andrew. I'm really excited to share what we're doing on this. So. I think we recognized pretty early on that governance is, is the aspect that's really appreciated. You know, if the community wants to feel like because they're supporting you, they want to help, you know, evolve the platform in the direction that, that it should be going. And it's, it's really awesome to have the community involved. Who wouldn't want the people who use your product helping you push it in the right directions? So we, we, um, the best way for us to do that initially, which is really great, is about eight months ago, sort of towards the beginning of the year, we did a smart contract upgrade where every user who, who owns a wild card, so this is a non-fungible token, for every day that you own a wild card, you are minted our, our wild cards loyalty tokens, these ERC20 tokens that stream to you. And these are essentially just our governance tokens and they allow people to, to govern the wild cards platform. And, and the main thing it allows users to do is vote where bulk funding should go to every month, which one of our conservation partners. We have lots of different conservation partners around the world, and it makes sense that 
our users are the ones who choose where this bonus funding goes. And a lot of the gamification work we put into it is firstly through using interesting mechanisms like uh, quadratic voting, which we really think pe allows people to better express their preferences. So it was fun pushing the boundaries with that and defending against civil attacks and, and really working that in. And another big part of it is actually having leaderboards. So very publicly on our page, um, users can actually buy their Ethereum address on Twitter with the three box service. And from that, we just pull the user's information and we can basically show the user, you know, how many days they've hold wild cards, who owns the most wild cards, um, who's got the longest streak for being the guardian of a wild card for the most consecutive days in a row. And, and through all of that, we, we're really hoping to, to push it forward and, and, and yeah, yeah, I've got some, some cool more updates, which I'll chat to you guys about later, but I'll, I'll leave it there. So really exciting stuff. That's really good. I, I, I love 3Box. I really want to get 3Box integrated with Boolean X and, and Avogadro as well. Um, what we're doing with governance is really the entire project for Avogadro is community owned and controlled. So from the very get go, even where we are right now, most of the actions happening in the discord but as we move to token distribution, we have a ghost token. It's pronounced ghost, but it's G-H-S-T, no O. Um, that comes out and, and allows people to basically interact with all stages of the ecosystem. So it's a governance token, but then also there's other ways to, there's other uh, parameters to the governance. So the Avogadro itself, this NFT that is a pixelated ghost that you own, you name it, it has unique traits that come because of the uh, chain link integrations with VRF. Because of all of that, you build a team of Avagachis and you can designate them to be your avatars in the DAO. So one of the things we're looking at is there's so much voter apathy with DAOs. And there's been a lot of energy put into trying to solve this problem with um, mostly from technical or tokenomics like uh, incentive based uh, rewards approaches. But really where we're coming at it from is this idea that it should be gamified. And if it's a joy to participate in the DAO and you earn rewards like more ghost token or XP points, uh, then that's, that's more likely to uh, reflect and, and defeat voter apathy. So that's where we're coming from because what we're going to do is kind of launch in two phases. The first phase are the Avogadro will come out in the next couple of months as in portals and you're going to have your Avogadro. And then the second phase is actually, we'll you know, get into later, but it's a metaverse. And you know, metaverses are very popular and, and there's a lot of things you can do with them, but the reason we're doing a metaverse is actually to solve this governance problem. That's the main impotence of why we even talked about it because what you're gonna be able to do is imagine a WIP meetup in crypto voxels or a Decentraland meetup where you actually are event-based in real time casting votes in a 2D pixelated kind of top-down Legend of Zelda type of world. And so that's where the Avogadro come in and your ghost tokens matter, but so does having a, um, an Avogadro that has certain uh, levels of kinship and other traits that are dynamic. So it's gonna be kind of a, an experiment and the DAO is gonna be able to vote and control all of these different things, including wearables and whether or not we issue more uh, haunts. The first haunt is 10,000 Avogadro, but beyond that, there's no confirmed second haunt. That's gonna be up to the DAO. And it's all gonna happen in this uh, real-time event-based, you know, meet in the virtual town square on Thursday, and we're gonna cast our votes. And so I think that's gonna be really exciting for ga gamifying governance. Yeah, I think these are um, great ideas uh, from both of you guys that any DAO could take uh, some you know, guidance from. Uh, moving on to Vlad and Dan though, I think one great way to think about gamification is just to consider it an incentive structure. And so with War Riders, you have players who can monetize their in-game time and skill. And with Hero, you have um, these derivatives that are designed to be a little bit more simple, maybe, well, not so simple, but maybe more fun. And so I'm wondering how you guys both conceive of your users. Who are you trying to incentivize and what are you offering them in terms of those incentives that no other platform really is? Vlad, go ahead. Um, sure. Uh, well, um, at Warriors, we believe that uh, games should 
to be fun and exciting, but uh, at the same time, players should be in total control of their in-game items and currency. Uh, we believe in open game economies that could reach far beyond the game itself and uh, be used in the real world without any restrictions. Um, many gamers uh, started to realize that crypto assets are a natural fit for that. Um, blockchain assets are scarce. They have supply limits and um, um, they're automatically supported by any marketplace or exchange that wants to list these items. Uh, it stimulates free trade, increases liquidity, and it is generally good for the players. Uh, when you play War Riders, your mission is to earn BZN by either discovering it in the game or um, killing your opponents uh, that might carry BZN. Um, the more time you spend playing the game, the more more you can earn, uh, which is, uh, you mentioned correctly, Andrew, uh, monetizes the skill and, and time. Uh, and so you can sort of think of it as human mining, where uh, real humans are mining the token by playing the game. So uh, this is what uh, usually drives the users to our game, um, aside from having an insane amount of fun blowing up vehicles. <laughs> I hope it answers the question. Uh, yeah, thanks, Vlad. Uh, Dan. Yeah, so you know, we when we think about our users, there, there's kind of two ends of the spectrum. One is the the ones that are there purely for the financial, and most of those um, users generally are highly automated. They're coming from. They're ultimately coming from trading desks. They're using Hero as an alternate liquidity touch point to. Um, you know, some of the more classic derivatives that they're trading maybe, uh, you know, across some of the larger exchanges um, in crypto. And, you know, we we really incentivize through liquidity um, and uh, utilizing our token, like, the, um, you know, implementing uh, certain staking functions and things like that, that um, everything is kind of designed to create this, like, kind of virtual, virtuous, like, liquidity um, loop that, uh, you know, where we're really using it to help grow network value, but also in, we're incentivizing users to to take tokens, earn tokens, stake tokens, um, and then it unlocks like things as simple as like higher rebate levels. Um, so uh, so more transactional traders on the platform and users on the platform um, are incentivized really to build and kind of scale their liquidity, um, make you know be a little bit more competitive on the market. And uh, which ultimately creates a better user experience for the platform across the board. At the other end of the spectrum, again, like as I said in the introduction, is that you know we're really trying to expose the emotional incentives that come out of um, out of trading. And again, when you have like kind of an average um, retail user in a market, when they're going to let's take something like going to like a classic, you know, very large uh, uh, crypto derivatives exchange like Bitmax. Um, and you have a user that goes there they they're chasing something that that generally is beyond just the financial and um even whether they know it or not there is um there's certain loops that are kind of uh, natural organically embedded in there that um some of them you know good some of them not so good and um it it ends up uh they actually end up chasing something that that really is beyond the financial and you know, we understand that clearly. I've been trading for twenty plus years and, and understand the, the 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 ups and downs of that for sure. And what we're really trying to do is is take some of those elements. And if you again, if you if you draw a parallel back to um, like you know building like uh, an RPG, for example, things like um, accomplishment, meaning, empowerment, social influence, unpredictability, you know, scarcity, all these elements, they all play into into trading and into financial markets, and so um, what we're what we've done is build elements into the platform and certain loops into the platform, all designed to say, "Hey, if I'm a if I am a um, an average retail user, or if I'm new, like I'm just on ramped into this and I'm learning how to do it, what can we do utilizing um, crypto incentives and utilizing kind of emotional benefit that creates more stickiness for the user?" Um, and ultimately, like, gets them through that J curve because we know that that probably ninety, at least ninety plus percent. It's not a problem. It's a, it's a, it's um, 
data shows that it's like 90 plus percent of the users are gonna come onto the platform and they're they're gonna go through some type of J curve um, to really kind of learn and it's they end up with this kind of sunk cost and what we don't want is we don't want users having that experience leaving saying like hey I just went there and basically deposited my money and left but um, can they come here, utilize tools that are on it, earn incentives that kind of um, flatten the, the the steepness of the of the um, the valley in their J curve, and um, also then provide them with you know education and community support to really um, become a, a better participant on the platform, and ultimately more successful. Uh, you know, the, basically the longer that they can stay there, the more they can learn the better their odds are of, of long-term success on it. That's a great thought, Dan. I like that idea of, um, you know, making it stickier and making it more fun than actually provides utility to the folks using the platform, to the traders. Yeah. Great insight. Um, we're running a touch behind, guys. So um, maybe just a little bit faster for these next ones, but I do want to give you each some time to highlight uh, the great work you've been doing. Um, starting with Vlad, I know that... Um, you know, thinking about blockchain gaming, it seems like a pretty crowded arena, but I, one of the things that impresses me about War Riders is that you guys have made some really big, impressive technical and token economic implementations that really make it stand out. You know, the deflationary in-game currency, the uh, human mining, and um, really a unique use case for Chainlink. So I just wanted to give you some time to break down um, what makes War Riders really special. Sure, thank you. Um, War Riders is actually one of those full 3D um, real-time MMO games with uh, great graphics quality that you would usually play on your like, PC or console. So uh, there are not a lot of blockchain games like this, so this definitely uh, kind of separates us from the crowd. As you correctly mentioned, the game is centered around earning cryptocurrency that does have a deflationary mechanism. So every time BZN is used for purchases, in the game or on our website, 30% of it is burned and the rest goes back to the mining pool. Um, the system basically ensures that BZN will uh, never fully run out, uh, but it will become extremely scarce over time, which uh, should make it more valuable. In uh, addition to that, we've been building uh, the game with uh, mainstream uh, adaption in mind. Uh, Together with Chainlink, we recently launched a brand new system that allows dApps and other blockchain-enabled applications such as games to use human-readable usernames for smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain um, instead of these like long hexadecimal addresses that you would usually see in Ethereum, which is um, uh, you know, very user-friendly. Um, and uh, by the way, I invite everyone to try the game out. We will have the intense distribution of BZN today right after the uh, smart con. So, uh, and you will get a free vehicle as well, so you can try it out for yourself. I might be doing that after smart con, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> um, likewise, Jesse, I'm really impressed by this movement from Bullion X, which was maybe the first ever asset-backed NFT using gold to back an NFT. And now Avagachi, which I think is a kind of logical but still pretty revolutionary next step, where you're connecting NFTs to DeFi and DeFi composability. I'd really like to get your insights on what you think the next step is for bringing NFTs into the DeFi space and really like some of the incredible use cases that could be applied there. Yeah. Yeah. I think as you know, meditating on, on this idea of value staked NFTs a long time, I, I can see like there's so many more use cases that we just don't have time to touch on, and I'm sure others will. And even just within our scope with the A tokens, we're seeing a lot of different things that we can do just within this game and this concept of Avagachi. So especially once you counter or bring in Chainlink, I don't think this project would be possible in the way that is coming together without the VRF that Chainlink just is, is delivering. So um, real quick, how that works is... Uh, again, very soon we're going to be issuing the first haunt, which is 10,000 ghosts. And it's actually delivered in what's called a portal because these ghosts come through a portal. They're interdimensional. They're, they're yield farmers trying to come home. And so when they come through that portal, that portal is the NFT. But then what happens is it engages as you purchase it, it engages the VRF and that randomly generates 10 different Avagachi with different traits. 
there's like six different traits that are randomly generated on a spectrum from zero to 100. So you, you have all sorts of different rarity levels of ghosts and they all have different collaterals because there's different A tokens. So you'll have a whole array inside, unless you get like, say, a link specific uh, deck, which is totally possible uh, of a link. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna have this randomly generated collection and the VRF is powering all of that. And so that's super powerful to be able to connect DeFi to the NFT and then use VRF and random, randomization to, to deliver this experience where even just that alone, before you ever get to the mini games and the DAO, you're already having an experience. You're opening it up, you get 10 Avagachi, but you can only choose one. That's kind of the catch. So you have 10 randomly generated ones. You, you choose the one you want and you choose it by staking the collateral into Avagachi NFT, into that portal NFT. And that portal transforms into the Avagachi that you chose. So it's the same NFT at the, on the back end. But that's what's happening. You're actually getting 10 to choose from. You choose the one you want. You go with the A-Link. It's got a bunch of rare qualities and, and you stake. And um, beyond that, Aave themselves use the VR, or not the VRF, but they use Chainlink Oracles uh, for their weighted lending um, from off-chain and on-chain to balance that out. So uh, Chainlink is very heavily involved in this. And um, I don't think it would be anywhere where it is right now without being able to pull all these different tools together that the entire Ethereum ecosystem has seen built out over the last couple of years through this bear market. And uh, so we're taking advantage of all those different tools to make a better experience. And I think as far as value staked NFTs, you're going to see more and more of these coming. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Yeah, I agree. I think um, Avagachi is really interesting because you combine the classic NFT experience, you know, using tools like VRF to create a collectible of a different rarity, but there's something behind it. There's some real money there uh, provided by Aave. Great stuff, Dan. Um, John, John, uh, I know that there's a couple different projects that are trying to do, to a certain degree, what you're doing with crypto-based philanthropy but I don't know as many that manage to bring in the values of the space quite as well as wild cards. You know, this decentralized, uh, each NFT is always for sale, you know, in, in using great economic theory with the Harburger tax, you know, um, just some really interesting stuff behind it. What are you working on now and what's coming down uh, the pipe next for wild cards? Awesome, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, actually, I'm glad you mentioned it. Let's quickly touch on that. Um, Wildcards has NFTs that are always for sale, which quite literally means anyone can come and buy this NFT at any point in time from anyone else. And in that way, we have a completely liquid market where you can always know that you can come in and be the different animals. And essentially, the always for sale mechanism makes sure that you get to be the guardian of this NFT if you're willing to give the most towards that specific conservation. So each NFT is an animal, perhaps it's a, a cheetah or a gorilla representative of a certain organization around the world, and whoever is the guardian of that NFT, every single second is paying and constantly channeling funds towards that conservation, and ownership is sort of almost liquid as, as these NFTs are always for sale. So, so that mechanism is fascinating, and we continue to explore that and, and work out which arbitrage tax rates are best and you know, incentivize us to, to give the most um, funds towards our partners while still really um, keeping ownership sort of at a, at a certain rate. So that's one of the amazing things we're doing. Another big thing is ramping up our partnerships. So we've grown and we now it's nearly 30 different conservation partners all around the globe. And we're continuing to level and release new wildcards um, very often to be able to support all of these um conservations so that's really exciting and a, a bit on a bit on the DAO and I think Jesse was saying earlier you know such an issue right now is 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 people don't often engage in DAOs and, and how do you actually bring them to engage into your platform and a lot of it is um, yes one it's boring and also it's, it's it's very difficult so another thing we've been working a lot on is our, our entire governance system could essentially operate simply through Twitter, which sounds insane, but with that three blocks link, we essentially want to gamify it. And we don't want people have to log on to our website. We're just going to have a tweet every month, and the user will just have to reply to that tweet with a certain emoji. And if they verify that, that public, their public address owns that um, Twitter handle, 
we'll be able to conduct our governance through something like Twitter, making it super easy. You know, it just takes five seconds, reply to your favorite emoji uh, on the option, and that's something that we just really think will be uh, uh, awesome to level up our governance. And then obviously another massive thing in the pipelines, I think we're all aware that, that gas costs are, are pretty insane and, and prohibitive, especially with a lot of us using quite complex um, mechanisms in our smart contracts. So very soon we're also going to have a, a layer two su uh, solution deployed and live, and that will allow people to, you know, give more and more funds to the conservations with less and less going towards things like gas fees. So watch out soon for some, some layer two solutions. There's been a lot of back end stuff going on that. And yeah, we're just really excited to keep ramping up our conservation partnerships, channeling more and more funds um, into these conservations worldwide and yeah, continuing to gamify the platform. So really stoked about it. Great. Um, we're unfortunately out of time. Uh, Dan, uh, I know you have that um, liquidity pooling program that you have running now. So if you could in 30 seconds, tell the crowd about that and maybe some of the incentive structures that go into that. And then we'll have our next panel coming up. Sure. So yeah, the liquidity producer pool is kind of at the heart of the hero token economy. Um, basically, the long and the short of it is that uh, the, the larger, um, the initial phase, uh, 250,000 hero tokens um, are locked up by each LP. Uh, for one year. Um, this unlocks fees, fee discounts, rebates, um, also earns pro rata share. We don't burn, we, we actually just redistribute uh, one third of our total network uh, transaction fees um, back to the liquidity producer pool. Um, so uh, we're opening it now, the second phase of it to community staking. So um, users with you know, with balances as small as, you know, 10 hero, if they want to stake it, they could stake it, and then they'll be par able to participate. Um, and I know we're out of time. So if you go to hxro.io and you are outside of the United States, because the U.S. is prohibited, unfortunately, uh, then um, you can check it, check it out. And if you go to the help page, there's plenty more information on it. Great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and sure. guys, <laughs> thanks to all of you. I could talk to you guys all day. Um, next panel coming up, though. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks. Awesome, thanks.